thanks to Synology for sponsoring this video. Hello everybody, uh, hope you're all well. Happy New Year, if you're watching this video around New Year. I suppose I've got no camera strap, so. I don't know, I don't know what sort of test this is. Yes, it can hold a camera. Anyway, without wishing to start the video sounding like an Earth, Wind and Fire song, do you remember? Do you remember? Uh, a couple of months ago, when Nigel, Mass and I went to Cornwall. And uh, I made a couple of videos, and uh, one afternoon, we went to the Batalak Mines, and I made another video. Pretty sure those guys have made videos there as well. But I got home, edited the video, and I couldn't release it. Uh, I just decided it was way too boring. Predominantly because I spent a long part of the video, by a long part of the video I mean about five minutes, which is a long time in a video, a 10 minute video. Um, I spent all that time talking about this 2470 GM Mark II from Sony. And uh, basically my point was that I think it's probably the sharpest lens I've ever used. That's anecdotal, I have no charts or anything to back that up but uh, it's a very, very sharp lens. The reason that five minutes is far too long to dedicate to that point is that uh, in practice, what that means is that compared to my old 24 to 70, which was a Sigma, um, I just have to use the sharpen slider in Lightroom a bit less. That's it. So um, I didn't think that point warranted a, a large part of the video. But I wanted to show you some of the stuff from there because um, I really like the photos. So I was racking my brains, wondering what to do, and uh, thought what I could do is talk a bit more broadly about my first full year using Sony while sort of interspersing those points with uh, some of the footage and photos I got from there. And then I won't have to subject you to the, the bit of me sitting on a rock talking for way too long about how sharp a lens is, which is incredibly boring. What has been a positive is the lighter weight. Uh, so yes, that's the plan. Now I've shot for over a year now with my Sony setup uh, from way up north in Iceland to way down south in Antarctica and lots of places in between and I have developed some uh, some relatively strong opinions, I suppose. Uh, now I did document some of these opinions in a video I did about nine months ago, I guess, about three months with Sony and I've just watched that video. Most of my opinions still stand, so there's no point going back to watch that video. But basically, in short, uh, the autofocus is fantastic and that's why I switched in the first place. Uh, image quality, brilliant. I've owned an A7C, an A7 III, an A7 IV and now this, my A7R Mark IV. I still own the A7 IV. Image quality across them all is brilliant. Uh, all the lenses I've used and owned, Fantastic. So image quality, I have no concerns whatsoever. Uh, menus, I was really concerned about, but the reality is now that I've set up all my custom menus, I rarely need to go into the, the menu. So day to day, that's not a concern. Uh, build quality, the story's a bit different. Um, I won't dwell on this point because lots of other Sony users have, but basically when it rains, which happens a lot here in Wales, uh, the contact points in the hot shoe get wet. And that, for some reason, makes the camera think that an accessory, an incompatible accessory, is fitted to the camera. And the camera gives you a notification about it every half a second or so, which really hampers your ability to take photos when it's doing that. That's incredibly annoying. What's more annoying is that, as far as I can see, Sony hasn't addressed it. Bit difficult to do, I appreciate, when you've shipped hardware. It's clearly a hardware problem, I imagine. But, I mean, at least release a, a better hot shoe cover that people can buy. As far as I can tell, they've not done that. So that's really annoying. But that doesn't address my biggest problem with this system. What an incredible place this is, wouldn't you say? I've never been here before. This is uh, Botalic Mines here in Cornwall. And uh, it's amazing, so dramatic. There's a fairly big swell and uh, hopefully there'll be a good sunset to match it. Sunset is in about three hours time, so um, there's a fair bit of waiting to do, but that's okay. Don't mind waiting for decent light. I'm not sure that here, as dramatic as this little spot is, I'm not sure it's the best place for a, uh, a sunset shot or any kind of shot really, because the bottom building sort of blends into the, um, the cliff. There's no separation. And that's also the case with the top building. Whereas if I go a bit higher up, I think I can uh, frame the bottom building at least with a backdrop of the ocean, which might look a little bit better. So yeah, I think I'll go up there in a minute, but amazing place. Oh. 
this height is quite nice actually because the chimney on the lower building stands proud of the horizon. I quite like that. I'll tell you what, places like this and conditions like this, you deserve zero credit as a photographer. Basically, you turn up and press the shutter button. I do have a polarizer on, but apart from that, I'm inputting nothing. We're all lined up shooting the same thing. There's Nigel. Yeah, there. Yeah, and there's Mass. There. I, uh, I had hoped to be shooting more than one thing here, but uh, I don't want to miss anything that might happen right in front of me. So I'm not moving a muscle. I'm going to stay here until sunset, just in case anything crazy happens. Might make for a bit of a one-dimensional video, sadly, but uh, yeah, I don't want to move. Right, well, I've finally gotten a little bit bored. So against my better judgment, I'm gonna go and find some other angles to take photos from. I probably won't get far, but uh, I'll go and have a go. Oh, I don't like the look of that. No, thank you. composition opportunities down here that involve shooting back into the sun. Oh, don't fall over. I don't typically enjoy shooting as I have been down there uh, with the sun at my back, but uh, seems to work okay at this location. And in fact, it can't be directly at my back. It was kind of, I don't know, slightly side on because the polarizer did a pretty good job of polarizing, which doesn't happen if the sun's at your back. Oh, it's winding. You know, I always bang on about how my aim is to take photos about things, not just of things. Well, this place signifies that perfectly. I have so many questions about this scene and uh, all of that just completely piques my curiosity. And that's what I mean when I talk about photos about things rather than just photos of things. It's a difficult thing to describe, but when you see it, you know. All those shapes, I love it. take the strap off I think while we while we talk about this um, so broadly speaking I would say that my first year or so with Sony has been a successful one I think uh, weather sealing or lack of it aside the biggest problem I have with this system and it's not just a criticism of Sony because uh, I think this applies to most of the camera manufacturers um, is that it's a bit boring. Now, this will not be a concern to lots of photographers. Photographers, as far as I can tell, seem to fit into two camps as far as boring cameras is concerned. The first camp is people that really don't care because their interaction with the camera has no bearing on their enjoyment of the end result, i.e. the photo. The second group, which I find myself sort of heading towards more and more as time goes on, is people who want to enjoy the process of taking photos and they think that their camera is integral to that. And as I say, I find myself heading in that direction. I want to enjoy the use of my camera. And this setup and this system just feels a bit, I don't know, sterile, I suppose. And as I say, it's not directly a criticism of Sony. It's a criticism, I think, of uh, the camera industry at large. I think 15, 20 years ago, cameras were a bit more interesting. And there's a fantastic video about this actually. I can't remember what it is, but I'll link to it in the description. And I don't know, it just seems like manufacturers are less willing to take risks with experimental stuff than they used to be. 
And uh, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because the camera market is shrinking because of phones, and I suppose it makes you um, you less able to sort of have experimental projects as a camera manufacturer. But I think it's a shame, because I think there are lots of people like me who are looking for enjoyment from the use of their camera. And I think it's why lots of people are heading sort of more in towards film photography, because uh, you get to use old cameras, and typically those old cameras have a bit more about them in personality. Now, personally, I'm not interested in film photography. Uh, I make these videos weekly, and it seems like a real faff to me to add another part of the process whereby I need to develop film or send film to be developed. That seems like a stress that I don't need. However, I can appreciate the joys of using quirky cameras, and it's the reason that I've bought this. And uh, I'll talk about this camera much, much more in uh, perhaps the next video. But yeah, I'm not leaving Sony. This isn't a, oh, I'm switching away from Sony video. Uh, I'm in way too deep with Sony now to consider switching. It cost me another fortune to move systems. And it's not the end of the world that I don't enjoy using these cameras because they do produce fantastic results. I just wish that I could use cameras more that, that I got lots of joy from just the process of using, regardless of what the end result was. Hence why I've bought another camera to deal with that. I don't know that this is any more interesting than me talking about lens sharpness, to be honest. I hope it is. Uh, anyway, yeah, in summary, I very much enjoy the results of my Sony cameras. I don't enjoy the process of using them. Make of that what you will, but I get asked all the time what I think of my Switch now that it's been some time, and uh, that's about as short as I can make my answer. Uh, anyway, thank you for watching, if I do put this out to watch. Uh, and a big thank you to the sponsor of this week's video, Synology. Uh, now, there is a machine behind me. I don't know if you can see it. So yes, this is uh, a NAS. And if you know lots and lots about NAS setups, then uh, please switch off now, because I'm about to absolutely butcher this as I oversimplify it, which I need to do because I don't really understand it. Now, I put off getting one of these for a long, long time uh, because I was scared of the... Um, the complexity, I suppose, but really it's very, very simple. Uh, now, essentially, this is a normal conventional hard drive, the sort that I just stick into my laptop to do some backing up. Now, there are a few differences between this and this. Firstly, the size, obviously. I mean, the capacity is, is obviously very different. This is tiny and that's, that's quite large. But aside from the obvious, if you don't know what a NAS does, basically this, am I pointing in the right place? Yep, connects to the internet. And uh, what that means is that I can be editing on my laptop thousands of miles away and uh, I might need a file, a bit of B-roll that I shot last year, for example, that sat on the hard drives in this NAS. And if that's the case, providing I have an internet connection, I can get hold of the files in this NAS anywhere in the world. That's game changing for me. And the second thing that's really good about this is that there is redundancy built into a NAS setup or there can be. So, as you can see, this is a five-base system. I have currently got three hard drives in it, so two of them are empty. Now, the concept of RAID, and not knowing too much about it, scares me a little bit, but basically, here's my setup. If one of my hard drives fails, and it will fail, all hard drives fail, it's a case of when, not if with hard drives. They are machines, basically, with moving parts. At some point, those parts will stop moving. But when that happens, hopefully in a long, long time, it's not the end of the world because there's enough data on the other two hard drives to make up the data onto a new hard drive when I put it in. Hopefully that makes sense. Essentially, one of these hard drives can fail and it's not the end of the world. I won't lose anything. Now, there are lots of different RAID configurations. You could have more redundancy than that. You can have it set up so that if two hard drives fail, it's not the end of the world, for example. Uh, the setup that I'm using is called SHR, and basically that's Synology's own setup, which enables you to have uh, different sized um, hard drives. Yeah, but in short, there is redundancy built into a system like this, as well as the ability to connect to the internet. Now, I use this setup in the simplest way possible. Basically, my laptop every night is scheduled to back up to this. So at 10 p.m., I think it is, my laptop will start copying files onto this. Now, you can do lots and lots of complicated stuff with this setup. Uh, I don't because I'm an idiot, but uh, you could do. And I mean, you could sync between the two. Currently, I've just got a one-way setup where I back up from my laptop to this, but you could have them syncing both ways. And there are loads of apps where you can do lots of clever things. It's very, very clever. To learn more, you can go to the link in my description. But basically, I, I use the simplest setup because as I say, I'm, 
I'm an idiot. Uh, but anyway, a big thank you to Synology for sponsoring this video and uh, making me see the light and that it's not as not scary as it seems. And uh, yeah, very good piece of kit. Uh, welcome to my car. Bit of a weird ending to the video, admittedly, but uh, I forgot to mention that myself, Nigel and Mass have just announced our next workshop uh, in the Arctic in July 2024. Yeah, it's going to be epic. Basically, we're using the same company that uh, we've worked with for the Antarctica workshops and uh, we'll be starting in Svalbard and uh, sailing around Svalbard for a couple of days, three days maybe, four three days I think, uh, before going across the Greenland Sea to my favourite location of them all, East Greenland, where we'll be exploring the settlements and the fjords and the wildlife. It's going to be amazing. And then we sail to Iceland where we disembark and uh, people will be able to continue their adventures, if they so please. Not me, I doubt. I've got a toddler, so I'll probably have to go home after a couple of weeks. But uh, yeah, it's going to be an awesome trip. I cannot wait. So if you're interested, uh, there's a link in the description. Um, I'm in my car because I've just driven to London to do some, uh, you guessed it, photography. But uh, first, food. My favourite thing about big cities, I think, the, the food. Yeah, choice paralysis there. I'll be fine. Um, see you in the next video. Cheers.